Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. We still have some people uh, joining on, but um, it is a little bit after noon, so I like to be prompt and on schedule. We always get uh, complaints when we don't start on time, so I'm going to start up with it. So I am once again uh, Matt Bach, uh, Director of Communications with the Michigan Municipal League. Um, you have found Monday Morning Live, the uh, webinar. Uh, we will also be posting this later after the fact as a podcast and on our YouTube channel of the Michigan Municipal League's YouTube channel. Today I'm very honored to be joined by a couple guests. Uh, first I have Chris Hackbarth, the League's State Director of, of Federal Affairs on here. And then we have Eva Cole, the Division Administrator for uh, a Division Administrator for the Michigan Department of Treasury, and Jeff Guilfoyle, the Chief Deputy Treasurer for the Michigan Department of Treasury. And they are gonna be here talking to us about the CARES Act funding that was recently made available to uh, Michigan's communities. Um, we had a webinar with these officials the last week that was very helpful. We had well over a thousand people on the webinar and we only have a thousand person limit. So, uh, so we decided to keep the conversation going again today to give more people an opportunity to get their questions answered because there have been a lot of questions on this money. So we're just going to get right into it. Uh, I'll start off with you, uh, Jeff and Eva and Chris, feel free to, to chime in if you like. Just tell us a little bit about what we're talking about here. Um, this CARES Act money, of course, the CARES Act is the federal stimulus package that the Congress and, and the President signed a, a couple months ago now. And now the state has made some of this funding available to communities. There's a couple different pots of uh, funding that's available, and I understand they have to apply for them separately. We're gonna focus on two of the pots today. So Jeff, if you could talk a little bit about what, what those are and what the deadlines are coming up and how this is important to our communities. Sure, so uh, two programs were enacted um, recently, uh, July 1st, uh, they are the First Responder Hazard Pay Premiums Program and the Public Safety and Public Health Payroll Reimbursement Program. And these programs really were an attempt to get some of the CARES money, the federal uh, COVID relief money that the state had received into the hands of local governments, uh, that, which is good news. Um, the one potential negative of that is because they're federal dollars relating to the CARES Act, they are subject to the federal restrictions that float around both of those programs, or float around the CARES Act um, programs. So I'll talk about the first responder hazard pay premium program first. Um, so uh, this is a fund that was set up to reimburse uh, first responders for the hazardous duty they've had to do related to COVID. Um, the program made $100 million available with a maximum of $1,000 per eligible employee and a maximum of $5 million per applicant. And the applicant is the local government. Uh, the application period is from July 7th to September 30th. So the application window is open. Uh, reimbursement is on a first come first serve basis. So the money will be distributed until it runs out. If it runs out, um, you can find the application on our webpage. Uh, the, the law says that the money will be distributed no later than November 14th, 2020, but we are hoping to distribute it sooner than that. Uh, the eligible applicants are cities, villages, townships, counties, public airport operators, and ambulance operators licensed under Section 2092 of the Public Health Code. And then the types of employees that are eligible for hazard pay include law enforcement officers, firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, 9-11 operators, local government corrections officers, airport public safety operators, um, eligible ambulance operators uh, and private EMTs and paramedics who contract with municipalities and hospitals uh, if the hazard pay premiums are paid through the applicant. Um, the hazard pay has to be paid to employees by September 30th. Um, the hazard pay only includes the premium that's paid to the worker, so it doesn't include fringes and payroll taxes. Uh, and you can't, uh, it doesn't go towards any payment that you're using other federal dollars to pay, such as the other program I'm gonna talk about. Um, the other, and I'll, I'll stop after I do the other program for questions. Uh, the other program, Public Safety and Public Health Payroll Reimbursement Program. So this program was set up by the state to reimburse for eligible public safety and public health payroll expenditures under the CARES Act. There's $200 million available for funding. Um, the applicants are cities, villages, townships, and counties, excepting those that got um, the, C the coronavirus relief funding money directly from the federal government. So that would be the city of Detroit, 
uh, and Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb, and Kent counties. Uh, you had to have a population over half a million. There's two potential rounds of this funding. Round one is open right now, and importantly, the deadline for applying for round one funding is June 17th at 11.59 uh, p.m. And for round one, you can apply to have public uh, safety and public health payroll expenditures that you incurred during the months of April and May reimbursed. There will be a second round of uh, funding if there's funding left over after round one. And so if there is funding left over after round one, we'll announce when that window will open and that would cover payroll for April through July. Um, the round one distributions will be made no later than September 18th and the round two distributions will be made no later than November 7th. Um, if we get too many uh, requests, uh, more requests than there is money for round one, we will prorate. Um, prorate the, uh, the money that's paid out. Um, the expenditures are looking at payroll and importantly the expenditures are for when the employee provided the service rather than when the employee uh, received the payment. And you cannot include um, bonuses or lump sum payments except for hazard pay and overtime. You can't include retirement payouts or long-term leave and FMLA unless it was COVID-19 related. Um, the eligible expenditures are public safety and public health payroll expenditures not reimbursed through other federal funds, uh, including overtime, normal sick leave and vacation, uh, long-term leave and FMLA uh, that's due to COVID. Um, hazard pay, as long as you're not getting this hazard pay reimbursed through the other program I talked about earlier. And then uh, fringes, including employer-sponsored insurance premiums, payroll taxes, and retirement contributions. Um, a technical note, you can't receive reimbursement for payroll that's paid by another unit of local government. So if you want to get reimbursed for the full payroll amount, and part of that was paid by local government, you're going to need to reimburse the local government for the funding uh, first. Um, as I noted, this money is, or I'm sorry, the applications are due by July 17th. Uh, and just a final note, um, and it's led to some confusion, and I'm sure Chris will weigh in on this as well. There, there has been some confusion because this funding is CARES money, so it is subject to the federal CARES restrictions and those and the guidelines that the federal government has uh, put out are a little bit confusing and occasionally feel a little bit inconsistent. Um, but the CARES guidelines note that the expenditures have to have been incurred due to the public health emergency, that they were not accounted for in the budget approved as of March 27th, 2020, uh, and were incurred for the period starting March 1st and December to December 30th, 2020. And then in some of the subsequent FAQs that they've put out, they've noted that you can use money that you've already budgeted for payroll expenses if you then end up having that staff substantially dedicated to, um, let me say that again, you can use that money if you've then dedic substantially dedicated that staff to mitigating the COVID-19 public health emergency. And so each local government sort of has to define what that substantially dedicated means when they look at the federal guidance. Now, the state of Michigan is sort of in the same boat and the state is using, and if you look at the federal FAQs, one of them notes that there's a public safety presumption where you can uh, presume that all payroll expenses for public safety and public health are pre presumed to be related to mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the state is using that guidelines to basically count all of the public safety spending relating to Michigan State Police and the Michigan Department of Corrections is eligible under the CARES funding. So we, we've taken a very broad interpretation of that language to, to basically count everything. And that's part of how the state has balanced its 2020 budget. And so with that, I'll, um, I'll stop and then yeah. uh, we can open it up for any questions that anybody has. Yeah, we got a bunch of questions in already. Go ahead, Chris. You want to say something? I was going to say, so just kind of dovetailing off that, Jeff, I know you and I have had some conversations in the budget office, some conversations. Uh, it's probably a lot clearer under, you know, if you're looking, if a community is looking at their own uh, personnel uh, in their police department, uniformed officers probably are in a different, in a different bucket, so to speak, than maybe the administrative staff for the police department. Uh, you can probably make a much cleaner case that those folks were, uh, that the uniformed officers were very much focused on uh, doing the abiding by the stay at home orders or handling specific calls related to COVID or on, du you know, on duty to fight the pandemic 
more so than maybe some of the administration. That's probably some of the calculus that needs to go into this, right? Um, um, so yes, and I would say even with your, you know, your regular uh, public safety employees, it is important to consult that federal guidance and make sure you can get yourself comfortable there. Like I say, the state has taken the position that, you know, after reviewing that guidance, that they're going to presume, for example, that all of the uniformed Michigan State Police officers uh, are eligible under COVID spending. So I think if local governments took the same interpretation as the state, right, they, could, they would be presuming that all of their uniformed officers would be eligible as well. Um, but, you know, we can't make that determination for you because it is subject to federal restrictions. So if the federal government were to subsequently put out, you know, guidance that said something else, then, then we'd all have to pivot based on that interpretation. That was one of the questions that's specific to that issue, which is how can MSP, Michigan State Police, take the broad presumption? Um, they're asking how they're able to do that, but you're saying it's, you know, if they're doing it, then the locals could do it as well. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? So if you look at the frequently asked questions put out by the Michigan, by the U.S. Treasury, which I recommend doing, and I, if you don't have the links, we can, we can find them and send them your way. Um, there, one of the, the second or third one on the list says that there is a presumption, you can take the presumption that public safety uh, workers are substantially dedicated to COVID basically for administrative convenience. And so that, that is the, the frequently asked question. Uh, that Treasury, or that the state is using to support its guidance. Now, now the issue potentially is, right, that's one uh, frequently asked question on, you know, 15 pages of frequently asked questions. So uh, we would recommend that you review the full 15 pages of frequently asked questions and make sure that, that you're comfortable coming to the same interpretation that the state did. And again, yeah, again, these are the federal answers to these questions, but you're following the same guidelines. Correct. Yep. That is on, I know we have that link on our webpage. We've put it out through the number of blogs that we've done with regard to uh, these CARES Act dollars. And Eva, I think you guys, we were talking this morning, you guys will be have it already on your FAQ on your resource page, correct? It is out on our website for both programs. It's toward the bottom under the application. And we also made it now another link right where the program links are. Awesome. Thank you. So right, and I should note something that could be a little bit confusing when you click on that link, it keeps talking about Treasury saying this and Treasury saying that. That's the U.S. Treasury, not the Michigan Department of Treasury. So uh, it's that those FAQs that go with the the CARES Act money. It's when it says Treasury, that's the U.S. Department of Treasury that is responsible for the guidance for that program. Okay, I know we've had a number of questions, and and Jeff, this might be Eva as opposed to you, with regard to the the payroll that could be eligible if it, if a local community deems their payroll eligible uh, they're looking at what was earned in the months of April and May not when those pay dates were correct that is correct they're looking at the incurred date so for April it would be April 1st through April 30th not when it is actually paid right what other main questions are you guys getting? I know we're obviously getting a lot on, on our chat, but are there some specific questions you're seeing common themes around these two programs? Well, certainly we've gotten a lot of questions from folks that aren't on the list of eligible applicants that want to know if they're eligible. In particular, uh, authorities have asked. And so, you know, the who's eligible to apply is, is pretty clearly delineated for you know, the hazard pay and, and the other program. And so uh, we, we've answered those questions. Um, as far there, as authorities, it's only uh, airport authorities, right? There's really no other authorities that are eligible. Yes, I believe that's the case. Eva, I'm looking at you. Are you nodding um, yes? I just, yeah, for the most part, there is some EMS authorities. I was just notified about those that are licensed under public, ed, or public yeah, the public health code 20920. So there are a few of those that would qualify for the um, hazard pay. On the payroll presumption, I know we've had some conversations with Michigan Treasury staff that if the employees are, are under the local unit of government, the financing mechanism is just the authority. Those, as long as the payroll is paid by the local government, they're still eligible under that scenario. It's only where the authority pays the payroll that we run into some issues for the payroll reimbursement, correct? Um, yes, it, you look at where is, who's paying the pay, the employees. So you're going to look at that. So if the local unit, the township or city, village, 
is making the payments, then they're the one, the eligible applicant versus the authority. We have a general feeling. Uh, There's 200 million for the payroll reimbursement, 100 million for the hazard pay. That you think we're going to use up all that money? I know there's some there's some 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 caveats. Should we run out or, or not run out? Then there's another window open. Do you just from what you're feeling since this was announced last week? What kind of applications are we getting? Is this money going to be gone pretty quick? Particularly the first come first serve money, the hundred million. So I haven't looked. Okay, you go, Jeff. You've looked at. <laughs> <laughs> As to say, we did get a lot of applications in over the weekend for these programs. Um, to be honest, right, you guys probably have a better feel for the universe that's out there. I, I know that having uh, talked to Chris, that I, I think it'll take a while to get through that hundred million. I don't think it's like, hey, we open the window on Thursday and a hundred million is gone on Friday. I don't think it's, it's, not, it's not Bruce Springsteen tickets. It's not Bruce Springsteen tickets. Now, does that mean that we don't run out of money? I don't know that, but I think it's a pretty considerable pot of money. Um, particularly, I think some of the private uh, ambulance providers that I saw submitted some applications with quite a few employees in them. So um, that that'll add to the list, but you know, 100 million is a lot of money. So um, I'm not sure if if we'll if we'll get there or not. Okay. Well, let's but dive. Into, if we get there, right? It, that's why it's first come, first serve. So if we're, you know, get your application on that in soon, and don't gamble that the more right. money runs out. Yeah, like you said, the deadline's September 30th, but you anticipate you really need to get your applications in way before that. Um, are are you now the other one? The 200 million. The deadline is this week, Friday. Uh, you know, I know a lot of our members, I'm sure, are probably focusing on that one first. Um, that's the payroll reimbursement. So let's, we got some questions uh, on that. Um, so, and, and uh, I'll just start off the couple that we got submitted before. It says, I can submit, uh, let's see, my officers are part-time and their shifts vary. Can I submit an application for hours worked in the future? But the schedule may change. The number of hours the department works will change, but who works them might. So it's a real specific question. Do you have any direction on for something like that? So this is, I'm assuming, the, the hazard pay? Yes, probably. Right. The so, so Eva, stop me if I start to go astray here. But I, the hazard pay doesn't necessarily need to be linked to the hours worked, right? You can pay those employees up to $1,000 for hazard pay, whether they're part time or, you know, they work eight hours in, in a month or 30 hours in a month. So, and you can, um, you can apply for a prospective payment. So, hey, we're going to make this payment in September. And so we're going to apply and then we will notify you. So you'll know that you have the money before you make the payment. I don't know if that answered the question directly enough. Yeah, that is correct. And actually, local units could pay higher than $1,000 if they'd like. They can just only ask for $1,000 in reimbursement. But yes, it is not tied to the number of hours an employee works. Well, that, the next question, I think, well, I think that gets, Jeff, I know you and I had a conversation. There, there's been, uh, after the webinar last week, some conversations about the hazard pay and, and the language in Senate Bill 690, which allowed for prospective payment if a community really couldn't afford to uh, to have those dollars out and wait for reimbursement. You guys are also working on a mechanism to provide essentially a grant along this hazard pay line? Right, so I, I wanna talk about prospective pay in two different ways, right? One is you're applying for prospective pay that you're just planning on making this payment in September and you wanna submit the application now you can do that and apply in advance. Wait until you find out if you've received an award before you actually make the payment. And we'll notify you, you know, if you get a timely application and you'll be notified before September 30th, you'll know the money's coming um, and then you can decide to make the payment. So that's sort of one group of people and you can, you know, put the application in. There may be some people where they want to make a prospective payment and even if Treasury has notified them that they're going to be receiving the funding for the hazard pay, they simply don't have the cash to make the payment until they receive the money from the Department of Treasury. And there could be a challenge if we're not able to get those payments, weren't able to get those payments to you by September 30th and um, you needed to make the payment. We're putting up a, we're gonna put up a process whereby you can, I will add a second form where you can indicate that you need Treasury to get you the money before you're able to actually make that payment from a cash flow standpoint. So we're working on that right now. 
Um, you can fill out the current form that's up there right now and then follow it with that second form when it's available because we don't want to close the process down while we're developing that, you know, uh, the additional process for people who um, are actually going to need to have Treasury front them the money before they can make the payment. Okay, um, let's see, there are quite a few on the hazard pay, so let's just instead of trying to jump around, I'll try to stick to those questions first. Um, uh, let's see, did you say the hazard pay needs to be paid by September 30th? When will we know if we qualify? So the hazard pay does need to be paid by September 30th. Um, Eva, do you have a ballpark of when folks might know? Um, just to make it clear for anyone else listen the local units have to pay the hazard pay to their employees by September 30th. Uh, we are hoping to be able to allow when people apply within two weeks of their application to let them know if they will receive funding. Okay. Uh, the other one's a um, question, where can I find the definition of public safety and public health? We have a public works and my officials believe that our water operators should be eligible under the, uh, the acronym PSPH. PR, which I think is the hazard pay acronym. <clears throat> Even, you know, I know we, we got a lot of questions that were emailed to us also on the uh, people who work in, you know, various water and sewer or, or, you know, some sort of public works. I don't know, Eva, if you guys have had a chance to research that question yet or if that's still an open item. Um, we have not researched that yet, but I believe in our frequently asked questions, which should be going up on our website very shortly for the public safety, public health one. I believe in there, there's a definition for public health. Can't remember exactly which question, but it, I believe it's toward the top somewhere. So if people review the frequently asked questions, I think the definition's there. And just on that, Eva, I think you guys have taken a lot of the questions I know that came in post webinar, and that's helping you develop that FAQ that you're posting as well, correct? Correct. And, and there was also a question related to what are we doing with a lot of the questions that were asked last week that weren't answered. Uh, we're obviously not going to have enough time to get to all those today, but our, our inquiry team is compiling all those questions and are going to post them on our coronavirus resource page with as many of the answers that we know. So some of them, like league staff can answer, some we will need direction from Treasury. So we're, we are working through those questions to answer that specific question. Um, and there was another, oh, uh, this is kind of maybe a question more for you, Chris. Do we need a council resolution or action to apply for either pot of money? Does, do they have to, do they need council to approve these to, to apply for this stuff? I'm not aware, and Jeff, and you're not. We haven't had any discussions with the department about additional uh, requirements. Again, these are these are state dollars the state received from the federal government. Uh, the state is sharing them with the local units, so the local units uh, would apply for them uh, as they would any other source from from the department. Correct? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think that question is more a question on um, your end than our end. I mean, there is yeah. a requirement that, you know, the chief administrative officer sign the application. And, and so, you know, that, that's the certification that we're looking for. Yeah. Is that correct, Eva? Part of the certification also requests the whoever's signing it to share it with their board. It doesn't require them to have board approval, but we are requiring them to at least share it with them so that the board is aware of all the federal guidelines and the terms and conditions of the grant. So right. that is part of the certification. Yeah, and there might be, I mean, obviously the council, local city managers and village managers would know best, but there might be local requirements if you apply for a certain number of dollars worth of something that does need council approval, but that would be a local issue again, I would assume. I know that was the case of some of our other programs where someone applied for something and then later they find out they had a cap as how much they could get without approval. So. I would encourage our members to consult with their local municipal attorney and their local city manager to get that kind of question answered. On that, um, theme, bye, just with regard to reporting, I know, you know, in terms of you guys will have some reporting, assumably that the, that the US government will require as part of CARES. Is there anything additional you're gonna require of local units that are subgrantees under the state? Um, currently, the only ones that are going to have to do some more additional reporting in instead of the application packet, we will do some risk assessments 
for local units and we may request additional reporting from various local units, not all of them, just certain ones that would be a random sample. And any local unit that is asking for an advance payment for the hazard pay, there will be additional reporting for that because we'll be making the advance payment to them and then they're going to be making the payment potentially September 30th. So they will have to report to us back the actual payments. That will be part of the second form. There was one question here related to hazard pay. Uh, it sounds like they're basically asking, can they submit in two separate, at two separate periods of time? They say, for example, they have police officers, um, but the firefighter is currently negotiating um, uh, payment with their fire union and they can't commit to that so they're ready to submit with the police officers but not yet with the fire can they do those separately yes they can submit two different applications I believe I saw that one pop up and I believe they were ready for their police and their fire they do not need to submit two applications one for police and one for fire they can include them both on the same application but then down the road if they come to agreement on the other one they could submit a different application Okay. And on that, Eva, just in terms of, we obviously aren't, you aren't allowed to, to double dip, so to speak. You can't claim on that the reimbursement and the, uh, the hazard pay allowance. But if a local community has given more than $1,000, would they be allowed to, to apply for the overage above the 1000 on their reimbursement on the public health, public safety reimbursement side? Wow, I don't know if we've had that question yet. Jeff, do you remember? So Chris, if you paid more than $1,000 in hazard pay in the, in the application window of, is it April and May that we're um, getting, re that we're allowing people, you could, it's part of your payroll. You, and if it's COVID related hazard pay, you could get all of that reimbursed under the one program and you wouldn't need to submit separately for the, for the hazard pay program. You know what I mean? It would be part of your payroll in that period and just included in your, the whole thing with your payroll on that application period. And in fact, you could do that. And then, so if you paid people $2,000 in April, right, you could submit that as part of your payroll and then do a separate hazard pay payment later on outside that window and submit that for the hazard pay program. Okay, very good. Um, uh, let's try to, I'm trying to answer, get some public, some public uh, um, payroll reimbursement uh, questions now. Uh, what's kind of the, what's kind of the main questions that you guys are getting on that one? Again, is it who's eligible, or is that one a little more clear cut as far as do you expend any, expended any payroll expenses in uh, March and April, I believe, for the months, and then they're therefore eligible. So I'll note that my impression from wading through the emails over the weekend is 80 plus percent of the email were first responder questions. So I think that first come first serve got people's attention. And yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the public safety and public health payroll apps that we got over the weekend were from people who had already submitted their hazard pay one. So uh, clearly people were doing the hazard pay first and then turning at least a group that, that came in, you know, super early on, on Friday and Saturday. The, the questions that we were getting uh, over the weekend um, tended to be either questions about, are, you know, is this occupation uh, eligible uh, if we have a couple on animal control, you know, and, and things along those lines, or people who have somewhat complicated arrangements going on where, you know, we have an arrangement with two townships in the county and the hospital and whatever, and yeah. how, does, how does this all work? And I will admit those were, as answering them, I was defaulting to answer the easy ones first. <laughs> Didn't really wade into those as much. Yeah, we have had some of those questions already. Um, and now there is a hotline we should probably mention. We'll put up the link to that, that if they do have questions, they can call you as well. Uh, the league, Michigan Municipal League, has a program that we're actually helping, helping our members with. The league has put up seed money for this program. So it's a free program where if you call, it's a name of it, Serve My City. If you um, contact Shanna Dreheim at our office, uh, sdreheim, D-R-A-H-E-I-M, at mml.org, uh, she can hook you up to that program. And we also have, uh, following this conversation at 1.30 today, 
uh, a webinar, free webinar, again, with officials from the Serve My City program to help you. So if you're a community that's really struggling with this, feel free to contact us or call the Treasury hotline. Um, but uh, we're, we're here to help you guys navigate these things because there is a lot of questions and unfortunately we won't be able to get to them all today. Um, but let's try to go through a couple more. I set my dog down here. Um, hey, just yes, see, you, do you guys, uh, you guys have a dedicated resource page with all of these links and all of these FAQs. Is there a quick way you can direct people to that? Or, I mean, we'll obviously put a link up uh, and share that with all the participants on it. Uh, I don't know if you've got it and you want to add it to the, to the chat panel, feel free to do that as well. But uh, that's where you have all of your application packets, all of your FAQs. What else do you have on your resource page there? We have links to all the federal document. We have a link to the CARES Act. We have a link to the SAM system because all local units have to register through the SAM system. We have uh, our FAQs, the federal FAQs. Um, boy, let me, might have it pulled up. We have all the links, you, you, anything that's in the application, we also have those on our website. So clicking on them through the application is one way, but they're also on our website as links. And you can get to them various ways. You can go to www.michigan forward slash treasury and click on the Treasury COVID, learn more, and then scroll down and find the link to the programs. Or you can go out to the Treasury Revenue Sharing website and go to the bottom, and there's the link to the two programs on the bottom there, too. Awesome. So, and I, I am pasting the links into the chat as we speak. Awesome. Okay. I know we've had, we've had a lot of conversation. There's a lot of questions in the chat about previously budgeted. I mean, I think when you read and, and this is what the state is doing, and this is in our conversations with the budget office during negotiations on Senate Bill 690. When you read the U.S. Treasury guidance, uh, the, the FAQ that they've added, and, and Jeff's kind of talked about this, and, and we can make sure we post that up as well. Again, Matt, maybe pull that link off of my blog, if you would, or, or off the Treasury's page. But it specifically talks about the fact that it is presumed that public safety personnel, public safety and public health personnel were devoted to fighting the COVID uh, pandemic uh, for administrative convenience. And it talks about that, that because of that presumption, that is kind of taking them out of the already budgeted uh, realm, that it's basically saying they're doing some, something substantially different than what they were originally budgeted for. So because of that, there's an allowance for those, those payroll expenses to be covered. Now, again, all the, all the legal caveats that are our friends at the Attorney General's office want to make sure that we, we comply with. But, uh, you know, that is, you know, that is how the state is treating their uh, budget, uh, budget offset with regard to these CARES dollars. And that is how this program is, is allowed for, again, it's, you know, much more clearly, obviously, I think with, with uniform personnel, but, you know, if you can make a case at your level uh, that someone was, you know, doing something under public safety or public health, the definitions that, Treasury's provided here, uh, and you're comfortable with that, then that's the ability to offset that payroll for April and May. Well, one of the uh, issue questions we were getting early on talking about the uh, the payroll reimbursement was that if you're a township or city or, or village that contracts with another agency like the county sheriffs, then you the, only the county sheriff can be eligible for that. What are you hearing as far as that are, are most doing that and then passing that, going to be passing that money down or how do you see those arrangements happening? So Eva, correct me if I get this wrong, but you're, if you're the county, right, you're only eligible to apply for your employees if you pay the money back to the township that paid you. So if, if the, if, and there's a good slide on this in the webinar slides from last week, but if you are you know, if you're Ingham County and, or maybe not use a specific county, if you're County A and uh, your local township is paying you for, for you know, uh, 20 police officers before County A could apply for reimbursement for the payroll of those police officers, they would have to reimburse the money back to the township. Did I get that correctly, Eva? Yes, they need to re reimburse not using the federal funds. They, they need to do a refund, really, of whatever their township is paying into them in order to ask for a reimbursement for 100% of their payroll. Right, and the township can't apply for that directly because that wasn't their payroll. Right. So. Is there an ability to, I mean, from a, again, from a cash flow standpoint for some of these communities, 
Is there an ability to coordinate some of the refund? We will be refunding on X payroll date to Township X or to City Y, uh, and then and then the reimbursement is eligible. It, can they do those things simultaneously, or are you going to require that to have occurred before they can apply? We haven't really discussed that part, but I believe it would have to be before because they're certifying that they've made these payroll expenses using their own funds. Okay. My boss uh, responded on Facebook to the answer to one of my questions earlier um, regarding it, does council have to vote? And he said, it may not be a state requirement, but local charters rules may require them to get council approval. So that kind of answers that. Uh, related to um, city managers, says law enforcement reports to the city manager, can all or a portion of their salary be submitted for reimbursement? I would consider that an administrative and the answer for administrative staff is no. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, Chris? Uh, I want to be sensitive to time with our treasury officials. Any other questions? Just, Jeff, well, I know we've talked a little bit and we've seen a lot of different questions about what what is covered under fringes and what is not. Eva, under your, under your FAQ part, do you have that pretty clearly delineated or is that in your application packet? What fringes count where? Um, yes, it is in our application packet and the instructions for the form. Thank you. And again, we'll be communicating regularly with uh, Eva and Jeff and, and the rest of the Treasury team. We have been all along. Uh, as we get questions, they've been great about working back with us to get those answers. I know Treasury is going to be taking a lot of these questions here. We will share the, the this chat log with Treasury as well so that they can uh, continue to develop their FAQ on their side and we'll provide cross links on on all the league pages for that material as well as getting our own our own answers out. So if you yeah. don't see an answer to your question that you haven't been able to get in, we'll definitely work with uh, work with the department to get those as, as nearly as possible answered. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that should be a pretty easy one for Eva, what type of supporting document documentation should we have for each grant? I have spreadsheets for my finance and reports from our accounting payroll software system, that should be sufficient, correct? Uh, yes, that should be sufficient for both programs. Okay. See, I told you that would be an easy one for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you, put a, you put a good blog up, uh, you put a copy of my blog up. I, any, anyone who's, who's watching today that hasn't subscribed, you know, Treasury has a, a listserv uh, for local officials and the league certainly with regard to uh, our Inside 208 blog. Definitely, if you get a chance, go to MML's webpage and please subscribe to our blog. That way you're getting legislative updates and information like this as soon as we post it online. And obviously we go way beyond uh, this conversation yeah. uh, as well, yeah. definitely. I can't, I, I can't quickly grab Chris's, oh, they did post a link to his blog. Okay, so there it is. Um, I think that's it. You know, I know you guys are, are very busy. I want to be sensitive of your time. Any other uh, uh, parting uh, words or any other things you just general advice to people? Has your hotline been overrun or, or is there still can somebody reasonably calling and get talk to a person? Uh, I think you can safely say we have gotten uh, many phone calls and emails and we have been pulling staff in from other parts of the department to try to make sure that you get a person then when you call. And, and we are trying to, to get answers. I mean, we, we, you know, we recognize the deadlines on these programs and we're right. trying to get answers back as quickly as possible. Um, but as you might imagine, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions. So we're working through them as quickly as we humanly can. Okay. Matt, I do want to mention, and, and we'll be working with the department on this, separate from all of this, you should expect to see more information from, from the league and from treasury uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, with regard to the whole budget situation. Uh, we've talked about the state balancing their budget and, and the MSP work. One of the things they're doing also is, again, this elimination of the August revenue sharing payment and replacing that with some additional CARES dollars. So we'll be getting more guidance on that that, is, that doesn't exist yet. We don't have any actual uh, action from the legislature or governor yet. We expect that potentially the latter half of July. Is that what you're hearing as well? So Chris, I apologize, I was pasting the phone number into the chat in response to a question. So you were asking about the August revenue sharing payment and when we may know more about that? Right. Was that? Yes. Uh, 
It's a good question. I, you know, I have not heard any updates on the budget. Um, you know, obviously they reached a budget deal a couple of weeks ago. I haven't seen bills yet. I, I have not even seen a bill draft. So um, I think at this point, it's not clear when, when those will drop and when those will start moving. So stay tuned. Um, stay tuned but, on that, yeah. Yeah, certainly again, this is, these are also CARES dollars. So I would assume that uh, any, any guidance that Treasury's produced for these two programs would continue to apply for those CARES dollar, to those CARES dollars at whatever point that occurs. Yes, yes, and, and, I, and I, I mean, we should also note that we recognize the challenge that, you know, the use of the CARES funds is creating, but it is, an, you know, it is an effort, I think, by the legislature and the administration to get more funding to local governments and to leverage those CARES dollars. And so, I mean, the good news is, right, they've been able to uh, stand up these two programs and they're gonna have, uh, you know, be able to stand up CARES dollars in, in the August revenue sharing payment. But the bad news is they also do come with the federal restrictions that, you know, the feds outlined. And, it, you know, we just have to live with that. Right. Well, and we continue, that's something I know we've had conversations with the budget office and with our partners at the Michigan Association of Counties and Michigan Townships Association. Uh, the league has been very active advocating with our congressional delegation. And for anyone who's, who's tuning in today, I would encourage you reach out, especially to your Republican members of Congress. If, if you have a, a Republican member of the congressional delegation in Michigan, please reach out to them and let them know how important it is that we get direct flexible aid for all local units of government regardless of size. That yeah. is just a constant drumbeat that needs to occur. Yeah, we expect maybe some movement on a fourth federal stimulus package, maybe potentially at the end of this month even. So it's very timely to go reach out now while they're still in district and before they get back to DC and express your concern and, and uh, support for a, a direct funding to local governments. Um, uh, that should wrap it up for us for today. I know there's a lot of questions on there. I do see one question. They said they checked the questions and there was nothing specific about water and sewer payrolls. I thought we kind of already addressed that and those. So uh, I'll, I'll note something that could, I think, lead to a little bit of confusion is the two sets of FAQs. So the FAQs that are up on the webpage right now are the U.S. Federal Treasury FAQs. And then we're going to put FAQs up uh, related to the program. And that is what's going to have that in there that has not been posted yet. Okay. And the last question here is a chief and a fire chief question mark. And I think we did, I said that answer before and that chiefs are eligible. You said city managers are not because that's administrative, but you do see as chiefs being eligible. Is that right, Eva? Yes. Okay. Right. Sheriffs as well. Sheriffs as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so I definitely encourage anyone, if you have more questions, particularly if you need a specific, specific help to your community, uh, please, please, please attend our Serve My City uh, free webinar at 1.30 today. It's going to be with Shanna Dreheim and Tim Dempsey from Public Sector Consultants are going to be answering your questions. We also have a couple more uh, webinar. We have one webinar tomorrow for our lakeshore communities or really for anyone concerned about the high water levels in the Great Lakes. So that's tomorrow. Um, please sign up for that. And then we have two more webinars next week, one on the Michigan Department of Transportation and some of the funding that's happening there. And another one, uh, Town Hall regarding the, uh, Chris, you can help me on that, the Supplemental Federal Coronavirus Emergency Supplement of Funding. I said supplement twice. Um, something like that. So that's another webinar we have next week. Those are Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Please go to our website, mml.org, and click on our events calendar, and those are all listed there. Um, we also have a separate pot of direct funding from the Justice Department, not coming yes. through. That's direct, uh, not necessarily coming through the states. Yeah, and that's another way our Serve My City program can help because in addition to the ones we talked about today, there are different pots of money for different pro programs and eligibilities that uh, we can help you sort, sort out. The last thing I was asked to mention was our Women and Municipal Leadership Program through our 1650 project. The applications are now open. This is a, a training program for uh, prospective uh, women interested in becoming city managers or municipal executives. Um, and the deadline to apply for that program is coming up. It's, um, I uh, had it written down, now. I can't find the date. I think it's uh, July 22nd, I believe. Yes, there it is, July 22nd. Um, you can go to our website or 1650project.org, I believe is the uh, email address or web address for that. Um, and that we're still taking applications of that till next week. So with that, Ava and Jeff and Chris, I really appreciate you joining us today on Monday Morning July, Live. Remember, July 17th, deadline, July 17th. Friday. $200 this, million. This, this Friday, right? $200 million on the line. So we don't want any money left on the table. Um, uh, so for sure, uh, apply for that. 
Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Treasury. Yep. Thank you.